All right. Hello, hello. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks so much, Sasha, for being here. Um, before we get started, a quick intro. Sasha is a machine learning engineer, a senior machine learning engineer at do it, uh, a remote first uh, machine learning company. He works a lot with Vertex ML and Google's entire Vertex space. And he's kindly come on to give us a very special MLOps meetup, uh, an hour and a half session talking about how Vertex works and then going into a live workshop um, on actually using Vertex on every stage of the ML pipeline. So we're really excited. Um, and we also have Katie O'Leary here, who is a senior user experience manager for Vertex. Um, Katie's here to kind of get feedback from the community to make Vertex better for all of us. So it's really exciting. She'll be listening in. And at the end of this talk and on the YouTube description, we will have uh, an open place to give feedback to Vertex for anybody who's actively using it um, and has things they want to improve. Um, Sasha, thanks so much for being with us. Guys, happy to be here today. Awesome. Um, so I think that because this is an hour and a half, uh, we'll just kind of let you get started pretty quickly. Um, and halfway through, after the talk, before um, the actual presentation, we'll take a quick break. Everyone can get a breather, stand up, stretch their legs. Um, but I want to give you kind of all the time you need to have to present. So with that, uh, you want to get started? Yeah, I can get started. You can share the screen. Yeah. And then I get started. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So let me start with um, the most important part, something technical um, that you can take with you after this workshop. We follow this link, um, the first one, uh, it's a short link. There's a page where there's everything, the article, um, I wrote about the article, the, the topics today, a notebook containing all the code, and also YouTube videos with deep dives as well. So if you don't have a lot of time today, um, you can also cover everything later on deep dive if you want to. And to, to today's topics, um, the workshop is all about XAI how to train and serve your models with Vertex AI. And also we take the same models, we train and so put them into a um, machine learning pipeline to automate the whole process. So you can make yourself copy equip something to train um, and also feel free to ask questions. We can loop them in at any time. We can also make this um, interactive. I have a few slides and I do a lot of hands-on examples today. So I do have slides, then hands-on, then slides again, then hands-on. So we always um, switch back and forth. I want to highlight that what I'm showing today is only a small subset of the features available with Vertex AI. So, um, but it's the basics you, you need to actually get your models in, into production. So, we should keep uh, we should uh, keep things simple until we make them complicated. And so, we should focus on getting our models into production for our customers. Um, it's more important than building out the whole MLOps toolset at the very beginning. Add what you need step by step. Um, no need to think about model monitoring if the model is not even in production yet. And I'm a big fan of Vertex AI because even the smallest teams can um, very quickly, with a lot of flexibility, put models into production. And with MLA teams, it's quite often that it's just a single person at a company. You always have to be teams with 10, 20 people doing ML. Sometimes you're a small startup and you have just one person doing the stuff. So it's a really good product if you're a very small team. But it also scales for to any, uh, to, any um, to any kind of uh, size of companies. And hopefully today I can show you how I can show you that machine learning in the cloud can be easy and flexible. And with that, let us start with the first topic on how we can actually train our models in the cloud. With Vertex AI, so let me share that top instead. I very regularly guide customers on how they can scale their training on, on the cloud. And every customer has obviously their unique comments and expectations. The overall process is actually the same. And this first part of top, um, I train a transformer model using the still work with Vertex AI. And as a machine learning framework, I use Overflow. But it will also work for any other kind of machine learning framework like PyTorch, XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, you name it. It's, there are no limitations at all. And if you have this process done once, you can do it next time in under five minutes. Usually, new ML projects start somewhere in a Jupyter notebook. You implement your POC to prove you have the right architecture. And then at some point, you need to train on a large data set. You want to put your models into production. And hopefully, you plan to um, ditch your notebook at some point. 
and put your um, implementation into a proper code repository. Vertex AI helps you to uh, automatically scale, uh, automatically provision and provision the infrastructure needed to train your models. So there's no need to manually train, a v, uh, manually manage a VM or a Kubernetes cluster. You can also train at any scale by defining the machine types and accelerators like GPUs or TPUs needed for your specific model and, and data set. And if you work on large data sets, you also have support for distributed training. On top, you get a proper locking and many debugging options. So it's almost like um, training on your local machine just at a larger scale. And if you, and if you still um, run your production training manually on a VM or on your local notebook, um, please don't, there, there's really no, no need for that. It's very easy to scale it uh, out to the cloud. To train with Vertex AI, we need to package our training code. That is needed because in addition to our maybe training.py file, we might have additional Python files and dependencies that are needed to run our training. There are two main ways to pack our training code and dependencies. And the first one is by using a custom container to pack the code and dependencies into a Docker container and then upload them to the Google Container Registry. It's similar like, like a Docker Hub. This is the most flexible way and it's, in my opinion, the best approach. The second approach is by using a Python source distribution where the training code and the dependencies are uploaded to a Google Cloud Storage location and less alternative. This is not the best way because we um, keep different versions of our training code in the file storage. Um, I would what I recommend use a custom container because if we upload the, the custom container to the um, container registry, it's already properly versioned. There are a few more, al more other alternatives how you can train with Vertex AI, but those are not part of today's workshop. It's mainly because I believe that the custom container, the first approach, is, is the way to go. So it's just a container that could run on any cloud if you need to. So there is no vendor login if, if you are scared of that. Anyway, as I, as, as I mentioned, I would recommend to use a custom container over the um, other alternatives for, for a bunch of reasons. It makes it easy for us to integrate it into a CI CD environment. Um, additionally, by dockerizing the application, um, we reduce the um, issues with Python dependencies that you have when, when you just run your Python code and you style it in your local environments. And you can um, run it basically in any environment where you can run a Docker container. It has support for hyperparameter optimization and different versions of the training application are still available in the container registry. So if you need to roll back to a different version of your, of your um, training code, you can do that as well. The overall process of creating a training application with a, with a custom container is fairly easy. Usually we have, at some point, we have a, a Python training.py with a bunch of dependencies that you can execute to start your training. This could be in your notebook, on your machine, somewhere where you, where you implement machine learning code. And we need to create a Docker file to install additional dependencies needed for, for, for our training, and we need to define a base image, so the, the base image where our container is running on. Then we build our uh, custom container as a third step using Google Cloud Build and push it to the Google Container Registry. You could also build the um, container locally on your machine, um, but I like to use Cloud Build because we can easily integrate it into CI/CD. And finally, we use that custom container to um, run our training job. And with that, we can already get started with the first um, hands-on demo. Let me switch to the code. And those are the notebooks that are also available for you. So if you want to um, follow it later on or now during the session, you um, want to. I have put this into a Colab notebook because it's easy for me to share with you and share with my the customers I, I, I work with. I usually recommend to have this in a proper GitHub repository and using your, your favorite IDE to implement it. I would not recommend to do this in a production line, but for me, it's easy to, to share with you. What we have here, we have, um, let me start with the, with the training application I just mentioned. The training application is, is just your, your ordinary Python code you have. And it's, in this case, I implemented it with, um, with Python. And I'm 
building a um, distributed TensorFlow model, but could be any other kind of machine learning model because you are executing just a Python code. And in that case, um, you see we have our uh, training pi, and if I execute this cell, the training pi is written to the um, file system. So I have the file here available. So it's almost like in a local development environment. I'm not going into the details of the machine learning code here because um, it's actually it's, it's unique for for every use case. You know how you how to implement your use case the best. It's just around how you can implement this model. But you can see here we, we have the ordinary stuff for for building it the Stillberg model, and we do our model model fit so the training and fitting. Then we save the model. The only thing which is unique to Vertex AI, we take the model which is which is trained and upload it to a Google Cloud Storage location. So this is the only thing which is now Vertex AI specific. Um, but you could upload it to wherever you want. You could also upload it to another cloud provider. You could upload it to another open source product. You could also upload it to Vertex AI. Um, I just uploaded it to, um, the, to Google Cloud Storage location. And we can see that when we execute the training in a couple minutes. So this is just a Python code, and to ex you see, as soon as this Python code is started, we execute the training, and the training for the model starts. So easy to set up. And now starts to, to um, where, where we have to actually implement our um, custom uh, training container. And for that, we have to, have to create a Docker file. And you can see, we, depending on what kind of ML framework you're using, you need to choose the right um, image. Because I'm using TensorFlow, a TensorFlow base image, and because it's quite a large um, architecture and data set, I want to use a GPU, so I need to make sure I use um, the right base image, which is, has support for GPUs. Additionally, I also have to install the um, dependencies I need in addition, so I'm using Huggy Face Transformers. I want to upload it to Google Cloud Storage location, and I also use Scikit-Learn for the trade test split and a little bit of Pandas to process the CSV file. So we, we, and then we can see we copy the training.py to the Docker file. You could also have more dependencies here, more, more from kind of structure works for any kind of, of repository structure. And then we have the entry point with our training.py. The pre-built container I'm using here is one of, is, um, one of the uh, um, pre-built containers from TensorFlow, but there are a bunch of uh, other pre-built containers you can use made by Google training, let me share another tab. So if you want to, to train your model for TensorFlow, scikit-learn, PyC to use, you get pre-built containers, and also no need to, um, to build your own containers. But if you want to, you can also build your own containers. I have customers, they run their training on C++ or even JavaScript. So they have their own um, Containers. But if you run on one of the major machine learning frameworks, there is no uh, base image yourself. You can just use um, a big one. And make sure if you actually train on a GPU that you're um, using the version which fits to your um, fit, fits to the GPU and also to your um, framework. Your support for Tensor, TensorFlow 2.9 is also for XGBoost and for, for those PyTorch versions. Those get regularly updated. Um, if, if you old version or on a, on a, on a, on a um, pre-release version, then you have to use a, another base image, but the major versions are supported here. And let us go back to the, to the code again. There it is. And after we have the Docker file created, the next step is I create a cloud build YAML. I'm doing this because we want a custom surfing container and I push it to the Google container version. So in order to be able to use it later when we initiate the training, you could also execute those steps manually on your local machine if you want to, so no need to use cloud build. But it's quite convenient if you later on want to build a new um, training uh, container for every code your GitHub is repository, for example. So write this to the file system, and there are, there are uh, three steps. The first is um, we build the Docker container by using um, a Docker build, and we define the um, Container name, container name, container name, and to the local file system where our Docker file is uh, located. Then we push it to the Google Container Registry, and we, we give it a name, the image name. 
That's it for our Docker, uh, for our cloud build YAML. And then in order to be able to execute those steps now, I have to authenticate this notebook so it can create with, uh, my, with my Google Cloud environment. So I'm doing this in the background. You just have to have to set your Google account, that's it. You allow it access. Takes a few seconds. And then we already um, authenticated. And now any command I execute, this could be either G Cloud or the API calls to Google Cloud or the SDK is now able to communicate. And what we now execute, we execute the cloud build process with our cloud build YAML. It takes our training.py, the Docker file, and builds a custom training container. So we execute this. It's now compressing the files, which are on my local file system here. It's uploading them to um, Google Cloud Build. And we can also, now it's uploaded, and we can go to Google Cloud Build. Let me share another tab again. And you can see we have the um, process here running. And it takes about three minutes until the um, images is uh, until the custom training image is built. So we have to wait a few minutes, but I already did it. So we can also check the other ones. So those are already um, done. And as you can see, we exactly have the steps. We clone, um, oh, this is actually the surfing container. And it's this one. Yeah, so we built uh, we were, um, the custom training container. We push it to the container registry. In a few minutes, this is done, and we can go to the um, container registry. So you can also search here to uh, registry, and you can get there. And here I have all my um, toggles. And if you go down to Vertex Bird Training, this is exactly what we now push. The latest is from two days ago. In, in one or two minutes, we see the newest image here. Right, wait another few minutes. By the way, if there are any questions in between, feel free to watch, uh, write them in the chat and then we can loop them in. So I just wait another few minutes. And as you can see here, um, should be there in a few minutes. As you can see here, we have um, all kind of um, older container, uh, custom surfing containers available. So um, if you push a new, uh, if you push new code to your GitHub repository, you start to build for the training container of the old one. So if you need to roll back to a different kind of um, training container, because there was some kind of mistake, you can easily do that here if you need to. So it should be there. Ah, it's already done. That's great. So let me reload the page here. And here we are just now. So we now have our custom training container. And if we now go back to the notebook, we can actually start our training. And how you can submit your training job depends on your requirement, your personal preferences. You can use the gcloud command. You can use the vertex SDK, um, any other client library like there's also client library SDKs for, for Node.js or Java, Python, whatever you need. Or you even can directly use the um, Google API to initiate this training process. Of course, you can also do it via the UI. Um, today, we uh, do this via the SDK. So the first thing I do, I define a bunch of um, parameters I use. So we have the region where we train and we have our custom surfing container. I have a job name and I also have a timestamp to give it a unique name to later on see when it was trained. And then we create a worker pool spec and this is where we can define out the machine type we want to use. So the hardware requirements for your model and needs to be chosen, bigger model, maybe bigger machine, maybe you need a GPU. And maybe you will run a small CPU model and you can run a smaller machine. You don't need a GPU. So be flexible to choose what, whatever you need here. I choose the N1 standard 8 and I take your NVIDIA Tesla T4. 
are all kind of different uh, NVIDIA GPUs supported, like A100, K80, P4, P100, T4, and V100. Uh, and we take this um, container spec this, uh, worker proof specification, write it again to the file system, so we have it here. And then we can already use this. So we take the gcloud command, say, say, OK, we want a custom training job. We create it. We define the region where you want to, to train on. Usually, that's the closing where also your data is located. And then we give it a display name, and we take exactly this config. And that's already all you need to initiate your training with, with Google Cloud. Uh, with Vertex AI, and now training is started. If we head over to training, so this is the I section. They have all the functionalities of Vertex AI. One of them is training. Later on, we also cover the endpoints, the model registry experiments, and also pipelines. But now we are here in this uh, training part. And now we initiate a custom training job. And as you can see, it's already pending, so it's now Spinning up the infrastructure we requested, the GPU and the machine types we, we defined. And it takes a couple of minutes and the uh, model trace. It takes a few hours, so we will not be able to see the, the finished model here, but I have it already trained yesterday. So we deploy this model, use the model from yesterday because it takes more than, more than one hour to um, finish the training. But we can go here into the um, training. Actually, you see all the, the find accelerators and machine types. You can also see which container is used. I use the latest uh, version of it, and you see the elapsed time. And what you also get is a CPU, GPU utilization. So you can see if you actually um, maybe utilize the machines, and you can scale down. Or if you're always running up 100%, you can scale up the machines. If you Let me see if I have a only here available. I have a lot of pipeline ones here. Maybe could filter them as well. I think there is one here. Yes, so training from, from yesterday. Oh, it's a little bit older from 18th of November. It takes one hour and 26 minutes to build this bird model. And if we go into it, you can see the uh, CPU utilization is quite low. Um, we have a high memory utilization, makes sense. And CPU is low, GPU. So I actually checked the, the GPU. You can see it's um, almost perfectly utilized here. Same for, same for the memory. And after the training is done, um, after the training is done, let me see, let me go back. After the training is done, the model is stored in Google Cloud Storage. So if we go to Google Cloud Storage, I have exactly the same location defined, like in my training application, in my training.py, and the model of it here. We could also upload them to the model. Um, uh, Model registry, but example, but we do that later today when we actually build a machine learning pipeline. This is to get you started to train your model model to the cloud. Quickly back to the notebook because I also want to show you how you can actually train your model using the SDK. We now did it via the G Cloud command. Usually, what we also want to do is maybe programmatically, and then use the SDK. So we install the dependencies. Let's see the uh, Google Cloud AI Platform. AI Platform is the old naming of the ML tools. They renamed it or changed it to Vertex AI. So both are still there, but both are in the same SDK. Don't get confused here. And we have to restart the runtime because we installed additional dependency. We started quickly. And then we initialized the SDK. I have to give it a project ID and also a staging bucket. And basically, have to say we have the worker pool specs. Instead of a YAML file, I now put it into a, a JSON. And we can image UI is not defined because we restarted the environment. So let me do that again. So now we have our worker pool spec. And we can start the same training process using the SDK and start the training here as well. So now we have a second training running. And you can start as many things in parallel as you need, depending on how many models you want to train in parallel. So we have now two bird models training here. So you can see it's actually easy to, um, to train your models on the cloud. Hey, Sasha, so we have one question coming in. Um, I don't know if maybe this is be more relevant when you get into monitoring, but uh, one question is about 
how do you enable model, model monitoring uh, for new versions of models, but deploy to the same endpoints as existing ones, if that's not automatic? Yeah, it depends on what, what kind of model monitoring you want to um, enable. Later on, when we go to the endpoints, I can also show you how you can enable model monitoring for your de deployed um, models. Because we just covered the training, and now the next step is put actually train model behind an endpoint where you can enable the, the model monitor. Get a bunch of built-in model monitoring functionalities, like um, how, how utilized the requests you get, but you can also monitor for, for drift and screw if you have a tabular data set, for example. So there are all kinds of things about model monitoring. But we cover them in, in a few minutes when we, when we go to the next time. Awesome, thanks. Perfect. And oops, sorry, one other question for training. Can we use spot instances while kicking off those training jobs? Yeah, with Vertex AI, there are no spot instances available, at least at, at the moment. If you want to use spot instances, you have to choose a VM where you get all kinds of additional efforts for your teams because you have to maintain the VMs yourself. Um, you could also do it with, uh, with, with Kubernetes, with Google Kubernetes Engine, um, but again, it's it depends on, on the experience and the size of your team. If you can confident, uh, if you can easily maintain your Kubernetes cluster or your VMs, you obviously can do that to save um, save a little bit of, of, of money. But Vertex AI comes, it's a, it's a um, serverless and fully managed service, and it comes obviously at extra cost. So um, you have to have to make the, 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 the business decision. If you want to put extra effort in maintaining all the Kubernetes cluster or the VMs, or you go the most uh, managed way and take Vertex AI. And this is obviously totally different for each customer. We have customers where it's really just one ML person who's doing the stuff, and they obviously don't have time to manage the VMs or the Kubernetes cluster. They use Vertex AI. Um, sometimes we also have, have customers, they, they did a lot of Kubernetes um, training, so they, they do their training on Kubernetes, and they want to go to Vertex AI because they are ML teams spend too much time in managing the infrastructure. So it's it's a trade-off you have to take. But I'm I'm all in for Vertex AI and take the extra few cents. Okay. Cool. Um actually we have a follow-up to that and all and one other question. Um so one of them during training, is there any way to enable real-time tensor board access? So while the job is training, while that model's training, to be able to access um, the tensor board UI. Is there is there an integration there? Yeah, absolutely. There are different ways to solve this. Um, you can write the um, outputs of, of your training, which you usually open when you open your TensorBot instance to a Google Cloud Storage location. And you can connect even your local TensorBot instance to this Google Cloud Storage location. There are also TensorBot instances here available inside of Express. Um, you can also host your own TensorBot instance. So in the end, it's just a file stored somewhere, and you can store it on a Google Cloud Storage location and open a TensorBot instance, even if it's training with Vertex AI. So fully, fully flexible here as well. It's, it's like training on your local machine. Right, right. Um, that makes sense. And so another question, maybe based on your original answer, saying going all in on Vertex as a managed service, um, we have one question asking about when to use, for example, Vertex AI from Google versus when to use Google's AI platform? Like, what are the differences there? When would you pick one or the other? Yeah, the AI platform was the, the previous um, suite or product suite around machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning, and they now introduced Vertex AI. So the old AI platform will be deprecated at some point. So if you, if you get started with machine learning on Google Cloud, always go to Vertex AI because AI platform is the old product. Always go in, all in for Vertex AI. Got it. And maybe similarly, um, as it relates to Kubeflow, although Kubeflow is maybe a different entity in and of itself, are any of the same components that are available in Kubeflow also available in Vertex AI, or are they kind of separate but trying to solve some of the same problems? Yeah, Kubeflow is a big set of very different kind of toolings about machine learning. It tries to cover a huge bunch of, of stuff you, you, you do about machine learning. Almost the same with Vertex AI. Um, you have support for experiments with Kubeflow. You have support for pipelines with Kubeflow. You have support for surfing your models with Kubeflow. You get this here as well. You can surf your models with, um, with the endpoints. You can train your models with training. You can um, build up 
about the pipelines with pipelines. And this is actually it's interesting because um, we covered that at the last part of the workshop today. We cover pipelines and the te technology behind the vertex side pipelines is actually cube flow pipelines. So if you build your um, pipeline with, with cube flow pipelines, you can easily run your pipelines here with vertex AI. So it 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 has a uh, there is some kind of interconnection between. Awesome. Um, last question, and I'll let you get back to to, to where you're at. Um, when you're running these jobs, these workers um, inside of Vertex, can you control them inside of a VPC? Do you have? I mean, I'm assuming you don't have to run them in a VPC, but do you have control to run this entire system in a VPC for maybe more protected um, entities? Yeah, there are ways, at least for the endpoints, to serve them behind a VPC for the training. Um, since it's anyway right inside of, of, of a Google Cloud project or a Google managed environment, um, I think there's no way to support a VPC, at least for the training. For the endpoints, it is because sometimes you have an endpoint where you want to get a prediction behind a VPC network. So there's support endpoints. Um, for training, I need to check it. I, I, yeah, I can, we can check that and uh, give feedback later on. Awesome. Uh, sounds good. I'm going to jump off and people keep uh, please asking questions and, and I'll come back in, in a little bit and ask some more. Yeah, questions are, are always the best part. So um, half an hour done. Um, we can go to the next topic on how we can reserve the model. And then I would propose a 10 minutes break to, um, to get something to drink or to eat maybe coffee wherever you listen to us. Um, so let's do another half an hour and then we make a short break and then we can continue. So now it's, it's all about surfing the model we just trained or I trained yesterday because it, it's still training in the background. And now we take this model from the previous step and put it behind an endpoint to be uh, ready to surf predictions. So you would take this endpoint and put it into production and give it to your product backend team and integrate it wherever you want to integrate it. And Google provides three ways to serve your models. Which one to choose depends, again, on your requirements. The first one is by using a pre-built container. This is the most simplest way, but less flexible. And if you need it more customized, you can use custom containers that are fully flexible. So the same like we did now with the training with the custom containers, you can also do to serve your model behind an endpoint. So you have the full flexibility here. There's also a third way you can use a custom prediction routine. It's almost the same like a customized container, but you have to implement less so you don't have to take care of the Docker container yourself. Um, again, I'm covering the custom container because this is the most flexible way. Let me know if you're interested in the custom prediction routine. I regularly do YouTube videos and we can do a deep dive there as well if you want to have a look into it. But before we take a custom container, let us start with the pre-built container. You should see, uh, you should use the container if um, if your model is trained with TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, or XGBoost. RML frameworks are not supported by the pre-built container yet. It's the easiest way. You simply need to upload your model um, to a Google uh, to a Google um, uh, Google uh, Google, uh, Google model uh, model registry, and you can deploy it to an endpoint, and you're ready to go. You can deploy it with the AI, with the SDK, or again with a gcloud command, or you can also do it all in the UI if you want to. If we, if we do it this way, we only have to provide two parameters. We have to provide the pre-built container made by Google and the Google Cloud Storage location where our model is stored. And let us have a quick look into the documentation to how we can see, uh, to see the actual pre-built containers we have for our, um, Surfing models, so similar like the pre-built containers we had for training, we also now have pre-built containers for surfing. So if we have TensorFlow, we have Cyclone, and we have XGBoost pre-built containers. Let me go back to the slides. For example, again, if your model was trained on TensorFlow 2.8, you choose it from the list, make sure you use a GPU if you want to use it for surfing as well. Um, no magic. Really effortless, easy to use, but you might have some more specialized requirements, and for that we use custom containers. Custom surfing containers are used for, for the small customized use cases, and a custom container is again just a Docker container containing everything you need to surf your model. And you need to create a Docker container yourself, like we did with the training as well. 
And companies have very different reasons to actually build a custom prediction container. For example, the pre-built containers do not support UML firmware. Like PyTorch, there is no pre-built um, container yet. So for that, you need to build your own custom container. Or you want to have complete control over the prediction code. You want to do some custom logging into your prediction code. Maybe you want to lock your prediction requests into a database, let on do some analysis on top of it. And quite often, we also need to do post or pre-processing for our predictions. For example, if you have to tokenize your input, if you're using some kind of transformer, you have to tokenize it first. And for that, we can also build a custom container. And another quite useful feature, if you want to host multiple models within the same endpoint, you can also build a custom container. This custom container needs to follow Vertex AI specific requirements. So we need to uh, we, we need to follow those requirements in order to be able to have a unique um, interface between our custom surfing container and the Google infrastructure. And we cover that uh, soon when we head over to the code. Deploying the model is a three-step process. It can be performed again with the API gcloud command or one of the available SDKs in different programming languages. And the first step, we have to create an endpoint. This, is, this has to be done only once for your model. And we can later on serve different kinds of versions behind this endpoint. Then we have to upload our model to the Vertex AI model registry. And then we can take the model and deploy it to the uh, Vertex AI endpoint. So this is a three-step process. And this is always the same if you train um, new models. Uploading the model requires only a few parameters. So the container image UI is either the pre-built container we just saw or your custom container. Very straightforward here. And artifact UI is only needed if you use the pre-built container. For your custom container, there's no need to provide the artifact UI because we're taking care of loading the model ourselves in the custom container. But before we can deploy our model, we need to create a vertex AI endpoint. As, as I said, the step is performed only once, and it's needed for pre-built and for the custom container. And make sure the region is the same as the model region, and the region is close to where you want to um, serve your model. And finally, we deploy the model to an endpoint. The first ID you can see in this example is the endpoint ID. We created in the previous step. We do the hands-on session now in a couple of slides. And the second ID you can see is the model ID. And there are more parameters, like the machine type, how we want to do traffic splitting. You could deploy a model and route some of the traffic to the newer version to see everything works well before you put all the traffic to the, to the newest version. You can use accelerators here, like GPUs. And the default machine type, if you don't define it, so I don't have a machine type defined, this is an N1 standard 2. So it's quite a small machine. And make sure you, you use the right machine for your model and for your, um, for your, for your uh, model requirements. After a few minutes, after we deployed the model, the endpoint is up and running and ready to, to serve um, the predictions. So to, to implement this custom container, we need to follow requirements. Nothing too complicated. And if you follow the requirements, you can get the container up and running with just a few lines of code. The very first requirements, as the name suggests, it has to be a Dockerized application. So the Docker container needs to follow um, those requirements. The most important requirement is we have to provide the HTTP server that listens for requests on um, 0000 and port 8080. Those are the default requirements. You can also override the port if you want to. And then we have to provide the HTTP path for health checks. So in order to tell the Vertex AI endpoint, OK, our, our model is ready to be served. Sometimes you have to load the model. Sometimes you have to initialize it. We need to make sure it's ready for serving request. Um, and then we return it to 100. And we also have a predict endpoint. This could be all customized if you have a different kind of predict endpoint or a different kind of health check endpoint. You can customize, it, uh, customize this as well. And the last requirement is around the input and the output, the response, and the um, uh, input. Uh, the request has to be in a JSON format, similar like, like um, it's, it's a JSON or JSON with every instances. But those are the only requirements you have to follow, except from, apart from that, you are fully flexible again. As I said, we have customers that are running machine learning models in C++ or, or JavaScript. So they're using exactly the same technology. You just need to be sure you follow exactly these requirements. And that, it doesn't really matter how you serve your models. It's, it's working because it's an ordinary um, data container. 
For this example, we built a custom container using Python. When we head over to the code, and I use it because it's the most used language among any ML use case. And as you can see, the implementation here, this is the minimal um, boilerplate code I need to serve a model. I use Fast API. You could also use Flask if you want to, or any other kind of, of um, API um, technology around it. And as you can see, I have a predict endpoint and a health endpoint. And the predict endpoint, and whatever you have to do for your specific kind of model, you can load the model, you can do pre-processing, you can do the prediction, you can do post-processing, you can add additional locking. So you're fully flexible. There are no limitations at all on how you can build a survey container. And then like with the training, we need to build um, a Docker container. I'm using a API based image. You could also use PyTorch surfing here if you want to, to surf your PyTorch model. You could also use surfing. You could also use TensorFlow surfing, but for that, we already have your build images. And then the same, we install dependencies needed for, for, for the surfing container. We copy our code. And I also copy the model. So I always recommend make sure you integrate all your artifacts, like the tokenizers, your model, model itself, into the Docker container, because Often see companies downloading the models from, from somewhere from a Google Cloud Storage location. And this um, leads to cold start times because if you want to scale up the service automatically, so you have auto scaling for vertex endpoints, and if you get a bunch of, of requests, imagine you have some Black Friday sales and you need to scale up the predictions. Um, and you for, for every instance you start, you download the model again. And this, depending on how, how large the model is, this can take a few seconds, but sometimes even minutes. So the model is initialized. So I always recommend to put the model into your Docker container itself to reduce them um, cost sometimes. Sometimes you can also, you, for example, if your model is hosted somewhere else on, on hacking phase or, or something similar, you could also run into a weight limits if you load a bunch of instances to serve your models and you always download the model from hugging phase, you could also run into um, weight limits on the hugging phase side of things. So always put, put the artifacts into the container, no matter how, how small they are. To build a container, I again use cloud build. Um, Three-step process, we download the model from the Google uh, Cloud Storage location, we build the container image, and we push the container image to the container registry, and then we are already ready to serve it. It's exactly the same like training your model, uh, building the training container, it's exactly the same. The only difference is we actually copy the into the um, container image. So to get the predictions, we can again use the SDK, the API, GCloud, or the UI. And I cover both of them. We'll now to the um, demo. I think it's enough of talking. Let's do some coding as well. So let us switch over to the code. And then I come back and I talk a little bit about limitations, because there are some limitations, and we need to talk about them. And I also um, tell you how how costly this uh, thing is. So let me share the surfing notebook. And as you can see, I have for every notebook, there's also a video, there's a deep dive article, and the, the notebook. And I share the link of our, of our workshop. So again, we first we authenticate them, so we can communicate with the GCP environment. And then, same again, we have a, a main.py. This is our actual code for surfing our model. And I can't say it often enough, you are fully flexible on, on how you surf your model. I return health okay immediately because I'm loading the model directly after the initialization of the .py file. And then I have my predict code. And as you can see, I have a tokenizer. So to surf this model, I actually have to do some kind of reprocess. To the, I then get plain text as input, so I have to tokenize it. And then I can um, put the tokenized text into the model, and then I can return the predictions, also do some kind of um, nice uh, formatting to get a nice uh, prediction response in a JSON format. So we write this train.py, it's again on the file system here. Then we also use the Docker file, and as you can see, I copied the uh, 
the module, which is later on in the cloud build process, gets downloaded from the cloud storage location into the local cloud build environment and added into the Docker file, so we don't have to download this. This is the cloud build process again. You could also do it, as I mentioned, on your local machine you need to. And then we start the cloud build process. Copies again the file. It takes again a few seconds. And then we should see a new build process here. So now it's building the surfing container. And this again takes a few minutes. And I already have it prepared. So we can go to the actual model. So if we go here to Vertex AI, we get to the section here. And after our Oh, it takes a few seconds. Actually, we can wait. Should be done quickly. Let me go to the um, inner register. And let me check the naming of the Docker file. So it's called Sentiment Fast API. So I have it here, and in a few seconds, we should get a new image here. We can also use, can also use the, the build five days ago to save us a few minutes. So the, the custom server container is now building. I'm using the, the latest a couple of days ago. So we go back to the code. And now take and upload it. So the, the custom container is now building. It contains our model. We upload now our, now also now our model, which is defined here. So you can see we have to define a container image UI. This is our surfing container. We define a port. We define the um, predict endpoint and the health endpoint, and also the region and the display name for the model. So I'm going to skip the execution here. Well, one anyway in the background, and we now can upload the model. It takes a few seconds to upload. to uploading. Let's wait another minute. Yeah, live demos, sometimes we have to wait a bit. Actually, it's done pretty quick. So now it's done. So the model is now uploaded. And if we go to the vertex again, the model, Model registry. Now we have our model here, sentiment fast API. I did it already a couple of days ago, so don't get confused with the old one. It's now the new one here. And the next step we need to 
create our endpoint. So we create an endpoint and we can actually mem to the box because I think I already have the old endpoint of this name. We just a display name, so we create this endpoint. It's done. So we go back to the endpoints in the eye. And you can see we now have this endpoint here. So now I'm taking the endpoint ID. The model is not yet deployed. We only have the model uploaded to the registry, and we have it, we have an endpoint. So I could also take the model and deploy it to multiple endpoints if you if you want or need to. So we take this ID because now we want to deploy the model to this endpoint. So I take the endpoint ID, copy it here, and I also take the model ID. This one here, and put it, put it here. And now we can define a traffic, full traffic to this version. You can also do 20 to the new version, 80 to the old to make sure everything works. You can define a machine type. And I'm executing this. And now Google is providing the infrastructure for you, making sure the model is um, probably running on the endpoint. This can, again, take a few minutes. So I'm I'm skipping this step and I immediately show you how it will look like with one of the old models. Oh, sorry, I was sharing the wrong, wrong tab. So I executed this one here, copy pasted the endpoint, the model. There's traffic splitting if you want to, and also define the machine tab. You got to share wrong tab. So I executed this. The now the model gets deployed to the um, endpoint, and we can actually see that in the UI. So I go back to the to the endpoints. Here we have our uh, endpoint, which we just created. And now you can see that we currently deploy the model. And because this can take a few minutes, and the infrastructure is provisioned, I'm going to take the um, old model, which I deployed, should be this one here, a couple of days ago. There we already have a, um, a version up and running. And now we already, the model is already now ready to serve your, your requests. You can also enable auto scaling if you deploy it to an endpoint. You can define the maximum number of machines you want to scale to. Um, you can also define the minimum number of machines. And now we are ready to serve our predictions. So I'm taking the endpoint, which is already deployed. This one here. Let me copy the ID. And we go back to notebook, and we can start um, getting our predictions. So I create a JSON file with the instances. You can see I put the raw text into it, and I take our endpoint and give it a JSON request, so our JSON here. And then we execute it so using the endpoint, and we should get the predictions back. So we have the predictions, so this one is a positive sentiment, and the last one is a negative sentiment. This is how you can get your predictions with a G Cloud, but you usually want to do that via the API or via SDK. So, programmatically, you want to integrate it into your product. And for that, we can also get the predictions using the SDK. We quickly install the requirements and dependencies here. And then we can, can do the same. Let me start one time. Can do the same and do it via the SDK. I again have the instances. You see just an ordinary um, array. Containing JSON text. So we do the same, different endpoint, the correct ID here, and we get the predictions back here. So this is how you can put your models into production behind an endpoint ready to serve at any scale. So this, if you now have a Black Friday, enable auto scaling and are able to, to serve the request no matter how many requests you get. And I mentioned, yeah. I mentioned I just, there are also some limitations, but if you want to put some questions in between, we can do that. Yeah, let's uh, before you go to the limitations, I think that might be a good a good time to to drop. Um, so the first one is: Are there any optimizations that can be made around speeding up deployment times, um, different model types, or different architectures or, or infrastructures like that? Yeah, the, the, there is nothing can influence the, the actual deployment of the model. And even if you have a very large model, it doesn't necessarily get um, get slower. So if you deploy a model with 10 gigabytes of size, it's as fast as a small model. It depends how quickly the infrastructure is provisioned. And it usually takes only a, only a few um, minutes. Obviously, if you if you want to deploy models in real time, this is a totally different requirement. But I think that's that's 
very rare where you really have to put your models within a few seconds in behind an endpoint. Yeah, for sure. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially with things like AB deployments and, and kind of blue-green scaling ups. Um, and then another question, this might be a fun one or a longer one to ask or to answer, but um, we have a question about what are your thoughts if you've worked on it um, with SageMaker as it relates to Vertex? Yeah, so I'm I'm also working a lot with with AWS, and sometimes it's it's yeah it's it's very opinionated what I'm saying here, but I'm usually choosing the product where where I get the best location and the, the easiest flow to put something into production. Both are great products. Um, but it's still about XAI because we have a very nice UI, great, really good documentation, and it's just working well and. With AWS, you have to dig a little bit more into the, um, into the documents, and you're less flexible because you always rely on the AWS SDK. And as you can see here, we just serve, serve a custom container. So both great products, they both have their purpose. We both we have a lot of customers running in both, so that there's no black and white shoes. Whatever you are confident with, is your, if your company is running on Google, keep it on Google. If it, you're running on any of the other cloud providers, keep it there. That's my opinion. Awesome. Um, that makes a lot of sense. We have one more question that just came in about um, the payload size limits. I don't know if there is some type of payload size limitation, but um, someone's asking about any workarounds for that. I would imagine maybe batching or something. Are there any built-in workarounds um, for those payload limitations? Yeah, so this is where we come back to the limitations. Um, as of recording of this session here, or, or workshop day, the, the, those are the limitations. Those are subject to change. So maybe if we watch this video in a year, maybe the, the limitations are already gone. So this is the stand of, of today. As, as, as um, the person said, there are limitations around the request and the response size. So it's limited with um, 1.5 megabyte. So if you want to do predictions on really large images, you need to make sure they're not larger than 1.5 megabyte. You can do that by doing intelligent um, encoding them to base uh, 64, for example, or any kind of reduced size. For the response, it's actually easier because usually we do just the predictions. So the only thing we have, a, have, a, have as a response is maybe a bounding box with some coordinates, maybe the, the class or the confidence scores. So it's less of an issue with the response, more of an issue of the requests or the image to actually send to, um, to the service. There are right. open open uh, support requests, open feature requests where you can upvote. So they are all tracked by Google. Google is aware of them, and they're actually working on getting those limitations done. Another limitation is around the size of the models. At the moment, the last time I tried a big model, it was um, kept at 15 gigabyte of model size. So it's actually the file size of your model, which is already quite large. But with the newer and newer transformer models, it can get up to 50 gigabyte of model size. So I assume there will be also support soon for bigger models. And there's one final limitation, and those are actually the only three limitations I have found supporting many, many customers on very different kind of projects, but only those are the really, really limitations you get with the service. Um, but say endpoints do not scale, scale down to zero. So you have always one instance up and running. This is less of an issue if you have only just a few models, um, but it, the costs will explode if you have to deploy thousands of models. We have customers, they deploy one model for each of their own customers. So there, obviously, it will not be um, yeah, business-wise good decision, but this is a very unique use case. And Google is also aware of that. There's an open support ticket, an open feature request, where they um, hopefully soon provide support for downscaling to zero as well. I can also recommend to try out Cloud Run to deploy machine learning models. If you don't need any of the other Vertex AI functionalities, you could also deploy to Cloud Run. So if you don't need GPUs, if you don't need model monitoring, if you don't need explainable AI, you could also deploy to Cloud Run. But I would always prefer to keep it in Vertex AI because you can easily take all these different kind of features like model monitoring, explainable AI, and put it behind your endpoint. And you don't get it if you deploy a model to, to Cloud Run. And I would imagine, at least with these limitations, especially as you go into the next section of pipelines, um, if you have, for example, a limitation where you just need to deploy your model and you need to be able to have payloads larger than 
uh, 1.5 megabytes. You can use Vertex for every step up to deployment, package that all in a pipeline, and then deploy it to some custom VM um, that is, for example, managed in GCP. So you're, you're pretty close. Um, you just maybe not all the way there if, if you have to get around one of these limitations. Exactly. Yeah, there, there are always ways. We have one customer who is really doing uh, predictions on really large kind of files, and they have it up and running the Kubernetes cluster. But it's a large company. They have a lot of people. They know how to to um, build out the Kubernetes cluster. So it all depends on your requirements and on on your ex expertise on this this topic. Awesome. Thanks. Regarding the pricing, it obviously depends on the machine type and if you need a GPU or not. And um, to give you an idea about the pricing, if you run it on if you run it on the smallest machine, which is N1 standard four, this is usually more than enough to run almost any kind of XGBoost model. You pay ninety dollar per month to run the model twenty four seven. And obviously, also depends how many requests you need to serve in parallel. If you need to scale up a lot, and you obviously have multiple machine running for a short amount of time until you scale down again. So it depends on the number of requests, machine type you need and uh, how many, uh, how much you need to scale up. Okay, that's it. That, that's it for surfing your model. So we now had training, we had surfing. And if there are no more questions, we could make a 10 minutes break. And we are back in 10 minutes for machine learning pipelines. So we take everything, training and surfing and automate all the steps we now did manually and uh, put it into pipeline to actually do this on a regular basis, do the training every one hour, or once a week, or once a day. Awesome, yeah. All right, well, then we'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, everyone stay around, and we'll, we'll jump back on. Okay, we're coming back. Um, let's make sure everything is up and running. Yeah, we are back. All right, Sasha, thanks. So what are we doing in the second half of this talk? We are now focusing on machine learning pipelines. So we take everything we just did and automate the steps. Awesome. OK, so uh, yeah, let's take it away. And I'll jump back in uh, for anybody who has questions in the chat. Great, let's do it. So and, uh, I start part of the workshop with, with a bold machine learning teams don't need Kubernetes. So thanks to Google. Our daily work as machine engineers and data scientist teams um, about machine learning pipelines got way easier and how that how that works we see now in the last part of, of this workshop. Um, if you're not familiar with Kubeflow or TFX, don't worry too much. Everything you need I covered during this workshop now, but I also have, have deep dive articles and videos because this is I can talk one hour about uh, machine learning pipelines, so I need to put it to the minimum. And I show you only the basics. There are a lot of deep dives, and I can also provide you the link again at the end of our session. So Vertex AI Pipelines provides a serverless product to run Kubeflow or TFX pipelines. So we don't need to maintain or manage the Kubernetes cluster anymore, which is great. So ML pipelines are usually there to connect various steps of your ML solutions. And Vertex AI Pipeline supports and TensorFlow extended and Kubeflow pipelines. For well, today, we focus on Kubeflow pipelines with Vertex AI and Kubeflow pipelines is built to one top of Kubernetes and one Kubernetes cluster can be challenging and very time intensive. And that's why Google introduced Vertex AI pipelines, the product to run your Kubeflow pipelines serverless. So there is no need for a self-managed Kubernetes cluster anymore. And this way your machine learning teams can focus on what they got hired for and that's actually machine learning and not maintaining the Kubernetes cluster. Little disclaimer, once internally on in Google side of things, internally also on top of Kubernetes, but thanks to Google in a way that we as, as users, as ML teams, don't need to interact with it. Um, I have a few slides where I can show you the basics on how you can actually implement a pipeline, and then we go back to the code and actually see how it's implemented um, with the code we, we um, did in the previous sessions. I repeatedly say the same thing. Things are simple until you make them, them complicated. And exactly because of that, I start with the most simple pipeline possible. There's two components doing it of, of string manipulations here without digging too deep into the details yet. Because we are implementing a Kubeflow pipeline, we need to import the required Kubeflow pipeline modules. And I go over each of those modules in, in the demo later on. 
Uh, vertex side pipeline consists of multiple steps, where each step is defined by exactly one component. The component contains all the code that this pipeline step should perform, and then it produces um, some kind of output as input for a component. What we see here in this example is a function-based component. It's the simplest one. We just write a Python function. And with the component decorator, you can see it on the slides, the component decorator, we say that um, this specific function is a pipeline component. The component could be anything like pre-processing, training, evaluation, deployment, anything you need in your pipeline. So you're again fully flexible here. The pipeline itself contains the components we created, again defined by a pipeline decorator. And you can see that the first input from the first component, from the concat task component, is the input for the reverse component. This is how you can build your actual machine learning pipeline. And the last step we need is the compiler. So the compiler takes our pipeline, our Python code, and creates a pipeline specification as a JSON file. That's all we need to run our pipeline. We could now go to Vertex and pipelines and UI or via a upload the pipeline specification as a, as a JSON file, and the pipeline is up and running. With that, we go to the demo, and I skipped the very basic demo, and we immediately jump into the um, pipeline code for the stuff we did before. So I have a complete notebook here. There's a lot of stuff inside because I have a bunch of videos out there where I really do the deep dives in XI pipelines. Um, I have two end-to-end -end pipelines here, one XG Boost and the Hacking Face example we did in the previous workshop. So we now go over the Hacking Face example. The first thing we have to do, I have to import the dependencies because we are using Kubeflow pipelines. We're actually using the Kubeflow pipeline dependencies, like a pipeline, a component, output, input, and the kind of artifacts, our compiler. And then obviously we also use AI platforms like Vertex AI to um, run this pipeline. So we import all the dependencies we need. Some boilerplate initialization code where we define both JDD and the location where our, our pipeline should be later running it. We do this, and then we start first component for our pipeline. This is our training component, and as you can see here, it's exactly the same copy we did when we manually trained our model. So there's no big difference. I just take my code I did before into a pipeline component. The only different difference is here we have this decorator, and the decorator defines the dependencies. This we need to install to execute. We also have a base image, which is also quite similar to how we actually trained our model before without the pipeline. So there are no big differences. And with this code decorator, we say that this um, pipeline function is a pipeline component. And apart from that, it's just the standard code we anyway have. So we execute this, and you can see I have here as a parameter, I have parameters to parameterize the pipeline, the training, like the epochs. And I have an output, which is the model artifact, and I log a bunch of metrics. So the output of this component will be our model artifact. And we log metrics like, and I think it's the accuracy score, which we log here. Yeah, we log the accuracy score for later on, see that um, in our experiment. So we execute this. And now our training component is done, and we can go to the next component, building our server container. As Surfing container. So again, the same uh, I did before in cloud build, and I do the build steps here, same we did before. And as a as an output, as a component, we need to start the dependencies again, like Google Cloud Build and the Python client SDK. So and we return a container, the container URI. We do this. And then we have the third component, which is deploying our model. And I only provide our model, I provide the container. And we have the same, we have an endpoint, and we have the model, uh, the model, model name here. And we do this, we execute this. Now we have our three components, our um, component for building the surfing container, and a component for deploy our model, upload our model, and deploy it to an endpoint. As you can see, we create an endpoint, we uh, create an endpoint here. We upload our model and we deploy our model. So this is exactly the same code we did before, just as a pipeline component. We actually, build our pipeline with the pipeline decorator, and you can see 
I add for the training operation, our training component, I want to you. So I add the strength, add the GPU, and I also disable caching for, for um, demonstration purposes. You usually can enable it, and it will be, be cached if there are new change, no, uh, changes on the, on the um, model, on the container itself, and um, it will be just um, skip the steps. And then we build our surfing container, and you can see we have as an input our model, because we want, now want to have our model as part of our um, surfing container. So we take the out component and have it as input for the second component, similar to the third component, where we um, take the output from the second component, have it as input to the third component, which is our um, surfing container. This is how we actually build our pipeline step by step. And then we compile the pipeline, we run the pipeline. So the pipeline is now done. It was just Python code again. Obviously, we use Cube for pipelines, and usually, if you don't use Vertex AI, you now have to take care of setting up a Kubernetes cluster because Cube for pipeline only runs in a Kubernetes cluster. But thanks to Google and thanks to Vertex AI pipelines, we don't need to take care of that because it's running inside of Google, and I don't care if there's a Kubernetes cluster required. I just use the SDK and divide into this serverless product. And if we now go to our Pipelines. So we are here back again, IUI. We have our pipelines, and you can see our sentiment pipeline is now running here. It will run for a couple of hours, like it did for our training. And if we have a look into it, you actually can see the steps um, one after another. And you can see we produce artifacts here, model artifacts, and uh, metrics. And those artifacts are important because we track everything that goes in and out of our uh, pipeline and through the through our, in and out of our components and through our pipeline. So if later on someone in the team wants to know what kind of data was used to train this model on, you can have a data artifact. And if someone wants to know um, which model was produced by this training, they are all track those kind of information. So you get this model lineage. And you can also reproduce the environment at all times because all the data that goes in and out, everything is tracked. So it now starts the model train. And I go to the previous pipeline one because that's already done. And it can show you a bunch of additional informations. So we have the metrics log for our track for our training. So you can see the accuracy here on the right side for the specific training. We also have a model artifact stored on a Google Cloud Storage location. So you can always get this specific model, which was produced by this specific um, pipeline one. And you also get the locking for your custom container. So if you want to lock, it's just ordinary um, Python uh, locking you get here as well. So it's it's really like training on, on, your, um, on your local environment. And if you go have a look into the job as well, you can see it's quite similar like to to the training we did before, it's running on the, on the internal job. And you can, you can uh, see we use the Avida Tesla T4, and you can also see the utilization for each of the components. This is how you can execute the um, pipeline, build a pipeline, and now you can you could schedule the pipeline to execute, be executed once a day at 12 o'clock and you get this continuously um, training for your pipelines. This is obviously a very small example here. There are many different ways because they're fully flexible to build and your pipelines. I have a few other pipelines built here, so let me share them here as well. Here's a BigQuery recommendation pipeline, so it can get as complex as you need it. Um, I also have um, this pipeline, which is a which is a deep learning pipeline for recommendation systems. And since it's just Python code, you can also interact with BigQuery, you can interact with any other cloud provider, any other kind of product, it's just Python code execute here. So there are no limitations at all. And the big benefit, Google takes care of setting up the infrastructure, take, managing the Kubernetes cluster. There's also no Kubernetes cluster in your uh, environment. You only pay for the machine types you use during the execution of components. And you pay, you pay a few cents per, per, um, per pipeline execute. That's it. So it's very cheap because you, if you usually have a Kubernetes uh, Kubeflow pipeline running, you always have the Kubeflow cluster up and running, even if you don't train, even if you don't have machine learning pipeline, usually always up there and running. 
And here you only pay if you actually run your pipeline. And with that, let me go back to the um, slides and I pick a few of the interesting slides. So we saw we can use function-based components. This is the, the, the most basic type we can use to implement a pipeline, but also implement a, um, the pipeline components as container-based components. We can also use a bunch of pre-built components. So Google has a really, really good integration into their own product suite. So there, there are pre-built components to upload a model to the Vertex and Model Registry. Uh, there are, there are people components to create data sets, to do batch predictions, so you don't have to implement the stuff yourself. You can also share components. So if you already build a component and you later on want to reuse them for another pipeline, you can do it as well by just importing the pipeline spe the component specifications. You, uh, you can parameterize your pipeline. You use any kind of, of artifacts. And you also get the model lineage I, I mentioned so it does answer questions like um, what kind of uh, data was for any specific model, and it's all stored in the ISO. It's always there and always ready to be tracked. So as I said, I can talk hours about pipelines, but let me go quickly to the um, to the price. So it's um, three US dollar cents per per pipeline one, and obviously the costs for the resource like the machine types and the views. So let me go back to the um, pipeline because, as you saw, we also have experiments. So each pipeline is tracked in your experiment window. And if you go to the experiments, you can see I have a bunch of old pipeline ones. You can see I had a power meter where I can adapt the number of epochs. And this is the metric I logged. And this is a way on how you can actually compare multiple pipeline models with each other and see how the model performance um, changes over time. Maybe it starts to decrease and your, your team needs to investigate. So this is, this is a way of actually tracking the different ones over time for your model. And so you see this is um, currently one. And the pipeline also uploaded the model like this did before manually. The pipeline now uploads the model um, automatically to the model registry. So we have this um, segment model here. And you can see I have a bunch of different versions. So every time I run the pipeline, I deploy a different version. So this is already deployed from today and also yesterday. So every time I run the pipeline, I get a different version. And if I want to, I could roll back to one of the older versions. And the latest version is um, put behind an endpoint and it basically immediately ready to um, serve prediction requests. Yeah, this was a very quick introduction to ML pipelines, but it's very similar to, to, to surfing. So it's like, there's this um, constant approach of using custom containers or Python code in this case for, for the ML pipelines. So it's, it's very flexible. You're really not limited and it's all serverless. So you don't have to take care of the infrastructure. And this saves you a lot of time, makes you really focus on, on, on your machinery problems rather than the infrastructure. And if you want to have a deep dive into um, pipelines, you can also check out my YouTube channel. I have, um, I think, I have 21 minutes where I go into the very deep details of, of Vertex AI pipelines if you want to. And if you don't want to miss all this, I have a link where I put together all the articles and code I covered today. So you can um, follow this link and probably put it uh, under the video I have in the chat. So there's everything you, you need to reproduce the uh, workshops. With. Fantastic. Um, we have actually one more question that just popped in, uh, which is about using vertex experiments versus vertex hyperparameter tuning. Yeah. Those are um, two similar, but yet different products with um, experiments. You can also track um, the performance of your model and your parameters. Experiments is more like you have a model and you really want to fine tune it. You want to run in parallel a large number of parallel trainings. So you want to try out different hyperparameters. You can choose the hyperparameter algorithms 
So how you want to choose the, the hyperparameters you actually want to, um, to try out. And then you get a nice interface where you get all the, the trials, all the hyperparameter trials, and you can see which model, which hyperparameter um, performed best. So it's a little bit different. Here we just compare pipeline ones and hyperparameter tuning. We compare the, we get actually the actual best and hyperparameter. Right. Fantastic. Um, actually, another question just popped in, which is about scheduling pipelines. I think you showed that um, a little bit earlier, um, but I'd imagine you can do it through um, either the SDK or through the UI like you showed, right? Yeah, it's um, in the UI not supported yet, but it's very easy. The Google has a really great documentation. Usually do you use the cloud scheduler. So it's just a cron job inside of Google Cloud. And this cron job um, is executing the cloud function and the cloud function is calling the pipeline. Sounds, sounds like a multiple step process, but it's very easy to set up. And I also have a YouTube video on how you can do that. Um, and usually if you have it done once and you do it pretty quickly and then you are fully flexible, you can adjust, adjust the cron job if you want to switch from hourly training to daily training. So yeah, awesome. it's working and it's integrated. That's awesome. A uh, question for me, how many, would you say across the, the people you're working with, how many production models have you trained and deployed in the Vertex platform? Like to what scale have you used it? Because you're such a big proponent of it. Yeah, we work, I work with a lot of customers, especially digital natives or so companies, they know how, how they use um, technology. And almost all of those companies have at least one model up and running with Vertex AI pipelines, with Vertex, with Vertex AI in general. So that's, uh, all the companies have, have models up and running. Obviously, we also have a few companies who just get started um, they, they, at the very beginning, but they are all in production, so it's, it's production ready. It's, it's working and there you can use it. That's awesome. Um, we actually have maybe not a question, but as much as maybe some useful feedback for, for Katie. Um, have you, Sasha, at least noticed when you're using the Vertex Vertex batch prediction service that it's slow or maybe not consistent with its performance, or have you noticed that to be pretty consistently uh, fast? It depends on the on how you how mu how much you need to scale it. because if you do batch predictions, you predictions to multiple machines. So if you if you just use one worker, it will be as slow as doing not using batch predictions. So you need to choose at least a a uh, number of machines to actually uh, distribute the batch prediction processes. And then again, in the background, it spins up the infrastructure for you. So it, it, it isn't any type of weeds called batch processing, and it can take a few minutes um, until it actually gets started, until you get uh, the um, predictions back. Got it. So it sounds like you're saying batch predictions are useful at scale, uh, wherein the uh, initial cost of spinning up the infrastructure is less than what it would actually take to run those predictions. So if you have, if you can afford the overhead of spinning up the infrastructure, then when you're using batch predictions, spin up multiple um, instances, that part becomes you know reasonable in time, and then it can actually make very very large amounts of predictions. If, even if you put your models behind an, an endpoint for online surfing for online predictions, you can also enable auto scaling. So you can surface many requests in parallel. Batch predictions are really optimized for really, really large data sets. Uh, or predictions are really large data sets. Got it. Awesome. Um, OK, fantastic. Well, we're at time. Thank you so much for taking uh, an hour and a half out of your day to do this. This was a really informative um, and, and really awesome session. We had awesome uh, uh, questions from, from the audience, which was fantastic to see. Uh, thank you so much to you and to Katie for making this possible, to coming on. Um, and for everybody watching, this will all be on YouTube. We'll share all the links in the description of that channel as well. Um, and later, Katie uh, and the Vertex team will share a feedback form for anybody who who's using Vertex, who has very specific and pointed feedback for them. Um, they're always trying to improve it. They're really into developer experiences. So awesome. Thank you, Sasha, so much for, for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. We can do that again. Yeah, this is fantastic. Maybe he'll do one on SageMaker next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome.